Praise God. Would you turn in your Bibles, please, to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. The book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3. All set? Praise the Lord. Now, just to understand, first of all, where we're coming from. Last week, the message from Acts 14 was entitled, The Crippled Life. The Crippled Life. Every person in all the world is crippled inside. It's not a word that we want to use today. It's not a word that's socially acceptable anymore. But there was a time when that word crippled. Everyone understood what it meant. No one wanted to be crippled. And there was a man in Acts chapter 14 that was born crippled, even from his mother's womb. The crippled life, broken, wrecked, can't get up, walk around, can't stand on his own. Can't move about. Mom looking at him from the day of his birth until the day where he was a man. Every day she had she or someone carried that boy around. Never able to get up on his own. Never able to move about. Never able to say, never able to say, Mom, I'll get it. Never able to say, Dad. Can I go with you? Unless he was carried by someone else. Not able to go on his own two feet. Every day, sitting on his backside, looking for someone to give him something. And then one day, somebody gave him something that changed his life forever. The gospel came into his life. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up. Do you remember when that happened to your life? When God comes into your skin and takes that crippled man and makes him stand upright before God. All of a sudden you recognize that what you could not do, you can now do. God has blessed you with his presence that you can stand before a holy God. You're not crippled anymore. But in that same token, the crippled man, now healed, made whole, can never go back. If he goes back to the streets, a healed man, and sits there with his arms outstretched for something, people are going to go by and say, what are you doing? Get to work. Get out and do something. You'd look pretty silly, a healed man still acting like a cripple. If we're a healed whole person, and God has done this in our life, and we keep acting like the crippled man we once were, with our inferiorities, our insecurities, dealing with all of our inhibitions and fears and cowering away and acting in no carnal way, flesh nature flourishing, and just say, well, you know, I was once a cripple, you know. What's the key word there? Once was, old tense, no longer. So am I now to start treating you as the crippled man that you once were and keep treating you that way to show my sympathetic, passionate, pastoral heart So that everyone will say, that pastor really cares for us. He still treats me like a cripple. What? What? Are you kidding me? You're in the wrong church, my friend. You're in front of the wrong guy. And you're serving the wrong God. You're looking for a pacifier and God sent you a pastor. God wants us to instead be treated as the men and women of God whole before him that he's created us to be. Amen. Because we're no longer crippled, we're now made whole. So now we must live, here's the sermon title, the corrected life. He has corrected that which was once crippled. No one, no one I've met, loves correction. 
including myself. No one wants to be, quote-unquote, corrected. But yet when God starts developing his humility in your life, do you notice that correction becomes a whole lot easier? Because you want to do right and be right and grow up before him? Every child needs to be corrected. Every child needs to be corrected in order to develop into a full, uh, whole person that is, that is socially an asset to society, right? You need to be an asset. To have a developed life, to a person who's not corrected as they're growing before the Lord. Have, have you met any of those children? Matter of fact, we were probably some of those children. And God saved us. To not be corrected is to allow ourselves to be in a crippled state. When God walks into our lives, the first thing he does is correct where we're crippled. So that we're now whole and we live that corrected life. Corrected is to be brought back into alignment. To be corrected is to be made whole. When you took a test or a quiz, somebody had, somebody had a standard. They looked at your test, your quizzes, and they took that red marker and they marked off what? All the things you got right. <laughs> no, they marked all the things you got wrong. Why are they always pointing out where I'm... Why don't they point out the 90% that I got right? We are by showing you what's wrong. Because all the ones that don't have a red mark on them are the right ones. There's a correction in order for what? So that we'll grow, learn, and understand. Everyone needs to have correction, discipline in their life. Today, one of the greatest faults that's going on in society is to correct nobody. To let children just run amok. No discipline in their life. No correction. Don't want to offend anybody. But God Almighty is not concerned with us thinking well of him. God Almighty is out to correct us. Why? Because he wants us whole and mature and sound. A corrected life is a sound life. To be crippled is to not be sound. So in this, we now come to 2 Timothy chapter 3. It starts off within verse 1 and says, but know this. There's a message in itself in those three words. But know this, meaning at the end of Paul's life and at the end of Paul's ministry, this is the last letter he writes. He's in prison, he's going to face Caesar, and he's about to get the sword to his neck. His life and ministry are coming to an end, and in this, he writes this letter to Timothy. And he says this, but know this. He wants him to know something. And since the Holy Spirit saw fit to capture this letter and keep it and preserve it for the past 2,000 years, then evidently he wants us to know something. And in this, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, but know this, it says that in the last days perilous times will come. Now, if he wrote this 2,000 years ago and says the last days, I don't know, what do you think? Last days, 2,000 years ago, we're seeing, it says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, Haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into household and make captives of gullible women laden down with sins, led away by various lust, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Look at verse 10 now. But you, there's the difference. How did verse 1 know this? Verse 10, what's it say? But you, talking to the saints, talking to Timothy, talking to believers, talking to those who have the truth, talking to those who have the Holy Spirit, talking to those who are God's people, talking to the church, talking to you and I right now. But you 
have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch. And what did he say at the, verse, at the end of verse 11? And out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, verse 12, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Verse 13, but evil men and imposters, and there's a lot of that around, saints of God, a lot of imposters, will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must, you must, but you must, verse 10, but you, verse 14, but you, notice, he's putting the change. He's kind of got this antithetical approach going. He's showing you one side, now showing, but you, what? must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, here are the two scriptures we want to focus on. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. In this, that the man of God may be complete. What is the Lord's intent in our life but to make us complete in Him? It says in other places in Scripture to be mature before Him. To be mature, to be mature rather than, of course, immature, rather than childish. He wants us, instead of being foolish, He wants us to be wise. Instead of immature, mature. Instead of adolescent, adult. Instead of being undone, He wants you complete. He doesn't want us undone. Crippled man, undone. What's He want? To be complete in Him. To be made complete. How does that happen? Notice in the entire chapter 3, outlined as to the works of the flesh and the perilous times that are coming. Lovers of pleasure, lovers of self, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient even to parents. That rebellious nature shows in all kinds and says, see how it's coming? And we know it rests in the hearts of every person. Matter of fact, when God comes into your life, you'll notice the very things he cleans up are those issues. In this, he says, but you... I want you to do this. You saw it in us. You saw the example. We see scripture down through the ages collecting and preserving a variety of testimonies that we know. What is a godly life? And what is an ungodly life? What is a holy life? What is an unholy life? What is a godly approach to God? And what is a form of godliness but denying the power? So we can see the difference. And we look, he says, so you have this. And now all of a sudden points to what? Points to scripture. It says, now. This is where we need to be focusing in on. Takes it all and looks and says, you do not want to live that crippled life. You want the corrected life. You want the mature life. You want the complete life. You want to be complete in Him. So in this, he points now right at the end, he points right to Scripture and says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, meaning what? God breathed it. Just as we saw in the book of Genesis where God breathed life, all Scripture is God breathed, inspired by Him. And is what is profitable for doctrine? First of all, we want to focus on that whole idea of profitable. I like the word profitable. I've seen both. I've had and even experienced both. I've had profitable life, and I've had a life that doesn't seem to be so profitable. Which one do you like? Profitable is better, don't you think? Living a life of being profitable, whether it's a financial gain or whether your, your family's flourishing or whether your, your life is becoming more joy-filled and more peaceful or whatever the case may be, profiting is the flourishing and expanding of, of prosperity. It is the development and it is the in increasing. I like increase. You go to the end of the year and you do your taxes. Do you like to see the black numbers or the red numbers? I don't know. You choose. We're not talking about government now. They like red. <laughs> we like black numbers. In this, profitable, increase, flourishing, prospering. Aren't those great words? Prospering. He's prospering, blessing, flourishing, 
expanding, becoming more. These are all good words, good phrases. We want that. And says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. But it doesn't stop at profitable and is profitable. But it's profitable for something in particular. It's prosper, profitable, it's prosper, prosperous, it's flourishing in something in particular. Meaning it does this for us. It is what? Profitable, first of all, for doctrine. For doctrine. The whole idea of teaching, taught, that you are going to learn something. That it is profitable, all scripture is profitable for doctrine. The teaching outlines, what we need to know. The whole idea of coming into and having something appeal to our mind in the sense of this is where you need to be. These are the parameters. These are the standards that you and I need in our mind. These are the precepts of which we build our life by. These are the parameters that we live and know things within. That scripture is profitable for doctrine, for teaching, for parameters that are set for precepts of which we'll build on. I know when Karen and I were bringing up the kids, and they started turning a certain age where you could start teaching them something, and they're now understanding, they're starting to learn. We didn't break out the calculus book. At six, seven, eight years old, and says, now, all right, you can do all things through Christ who will strengthen you. Learn this. But rather, it was precept upon precept. One plus one is what? And they look at you, but that's where it began. That's where it began. Now, one plus one, how many do I have? Count them, right? And it sounds so silly, but that's where it begins. You get to flourish and develop, and many people today in the things of God don't want to get past that. The whole idea of, if I can just learn addition, I don't care about multiplication, and yet prospering in multiplication is much better than addition. God is a multiplier. He multiplies in our life, and he wants to teach us precept upon precept. I remember trying to teach Adam how to, how to spell and understand the words, the difference between cat, rat, bat. What a chore. I tell you. No matter what, if I said bat, cat, and rat, and he got them all right, and when I said, so what's this one? It was a different one. And I, I was, it was frustrating at the time. But you know, this is, what it, this is what's amazing. He learned. Here we are now 20 years later, and he now knows. <laughs> All right? And not only that, he's gone well beyond what I expected. He now knows not only what a bat rat, he knows how to spell it, he knows how to say it, he can point it out in the sky. It's well beyond. Flourishing. Increase. That's what God wants to do in our life. He wants to develop us. He wants us to know so that you now, what? So that you now know, just as he said in chapter 3, verse 1, but what? Know this. He's teaching, but know this. He wants us to what? I can't say it enough. He wants us to know this, that these are the times that are coming. Since you now know these things, apply yourself to this and stay here. Know this. Learn this. Allow your mind to be taught precept upon precept. Our dear friend Dolores just said and gave testimony, I'm 75 years old and I'm a baby. But you know, as long as you thought that you were all of this and that, you weren't going anywhere. Until you came to the realization that I need to learn. Now you wait how God multiplies in your life. Wait, you'll watch it, see it. You'll see it develop. He will multiply, and it will seem like small at first. One plus one, two. All right, what's one times one? One. I went backwards. It seems like I'm not getting it. No, he's now teaching you multiplication. All of a sudden, you start realizing two times two, four. Four times four, 16. 16 times 16. Oh, you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, 
I noticed no one yelled out the answer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Profitable to gain an understanding, to have this precept upon precept. A command has been given. A rule has been established. Something, a precept has come into your mind and you now are called to live in accordance with what you now know. When you were a child, you acted like a child. You walked like a child. You talked like a child. But what, what does Paul say? But, but now that you're mature and you know, now act accordingly. Because when you're doing something and you're six and you're seven and you look and say, well, hey, they're six and seven. But when they're 30 and 40 and act in the same way, it's a problem. So instead, you want them to grow and to mature and what? Act their age. My mom, who's here today, used to tell me that every so often. Not in the past 20 years, at least. Act your age. Well, what if we were to say that and say, start acting who you are in the Lord. Start acting and behaving. You don't want to be that crippled person anymore. You want to live in accordance with the corrected life. You want instead to live as that mature man to be made complete in him. To be complete in him. Imagine a child that comes to about six months develop in a mother's womb and is not fully developed. It's incomplete. Not made complete. Wouldn't you want that baby completed? Don't you want that baby in the womb to be completed before born and brought forth? I don't know. What happened to the crippled man? The mom who birthed forth the crippled baby. An incomplete baby. The soul is there. The life is there. The acknowledgement is there. But the legs don't work. God Almighty is messing in your womb and developing you to be complete so that you are that full person born. But you're still that baby, as Dolores said. We just saw this morning Joel and Julie's baby Reed walk a good 10 feet right across. Just a beautiful little way of... <laughs> and my granddaughter Joellen's just looking. What's he doing? Doesn't he know that this way works well too? <laughs> Not ready. Ready. Difference. Not with disdain looking upon one or the other. Isn't Joel an older? <laughs> All right, let's go to the next one. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You could be sitting here for 20 years and still be walking as that baby on all four. You haven't yet come to age. And we can look and say, aren't you older? Haven't you been a Christian longer? Haven't you? Haven't you been carrying your Bible, going to church, singing the songs? And how come you still act that way? <laughs> Looking at others going by you. Look at Reed, he's all ready. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> God's developing us, making us complete, and he's going to do what? Teach you. How? The scriptures. I don't have to read my Bible. The pastor tells me every Sunday morning what I need to know. Are you kidding me? Do you think in the past 45 minutes over the past five years, once a week, that you're going to learn everything you and I need to know? What about all of life lessons that are out there for you to apply scripture to? What about the development of your own personal relationship with the Lord? What about coming to know who he is? What about developing a, a, his spiritual sense in you? What about discernment? What about all the giftedness? What about development? We need to have more. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Cool. Rather than, what's he say? What's he telling me? I want to know. And not only do I want to know, I want it applied to my life. Apply it to my life. This is what I've dedicated my past 20 plus years towards, is dedicating my life to the scriptures. More importantly, asking the Lord to make this applied to my life. See, it's apply yourself to it, apply it to you. That's his spirit. God breathed life. 
Lord, I want your life in me. He'll always bring you to Scripture. The very thing that is constantly attacked, assaulted, disregarded, ignored, and gains dust on the table or in the draw is the very thing that breathes life into who we are. Faith believes it. Not just happenstance like, well, faith is some blind step. Nope. It's the promises of God that you live in accordance with. It says now, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. And secondly, for reproof. For reproof. This is the tested part. Last one was the taught part. This is the tested part where God tests. The scriptures test. It is that which you test validity. That which you test validity. Does something have merit? Not looking at scripture and saying, does it have merit? Now you're in the seating in the scornful. It's not looking at scripture and saying, does it have merit? Let me see. Like some prideful person knows, let me see if it meets my muster. Then you're making yourself the standard. Rather, it, this is the standard and all things measure to it instead. And it is what tests validity. It is where you see and look at something as to whether it has merit, whether it is truth or lie, whether it is God or devil, where it is for or against, whether it is godly or ungodly, holy, unholy, clean, unclean, pure, impure. How do I know? Reproof. Where we test something, where we can look in that corrected stance and find the fault. It is not being a fault finder. Reproof is being a truth seeker. Many people are fault finders sitting in pews everywhere. Many people are sitting in, their TV, in front of their TVs right now. Well, I don't go to church. They're full of hypocrites. Yeah. Call the stove, call the kettle black. In this, given, profitable for doctrine, for reproof. It's something that you test something else by. It is that thing that you, you look for fault. You blame something for fault. And scripture is what? This isn't pastor looking and saying you're at fault. Rather, it's scripture saying this is the standard. This is what we're looking at. This you look at. Humility, pride's going to all of a sudden show itself. Humility. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 about having the, high, the mind of Christ, the same humble mind of Christ. And all of a sudden he starts showing us pride and ego and vanity and humility is seen in Christ and all his prophets and all the apostles and you start recognizing saying, oh Lord, see how it was used to show fault in my life? So we start recognizing that scripture, all scripture is profitable for doctrine and for reproof. For being able to point out and show where a person doesn't give, isn't walking in humility, doesn't understand holiness, has, doesn't understand. They're learning, they're growing, so what? So that you can become complete. This is usually when pride shows up, defense mechanisms come up. Who are you to be the judge of me? You're self-righteous, holier than thou. And all of these things that we say to try to what? Deflect it. You've heard me tell you in time past about the, 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 star, the show Star Trek where they have the, 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 the spaceship and they, they love putting their shields up when danger is present? Am I the only one? Okay. Saying, boy, great illustration. Star Trek spaceship going and all of a sudden an enemy starts coming around in a different ship and all of a sudden it's lasers locked on us and what do they do? Shields up. You can't touch me. That's all that stuff is. Just their shields. Shields. Put the shields up. You're this. You're that. Why do you think you're the standard? We can just go to another church. Why can't we just do this? We can do that. We, you know, all, this, all kinds of deflections. Ding, ding, ding. And all of a sudden you realize my shields are coming down 90%, 80%, 60%. Shields are down. Impulse power. We're barely creeping along. <laughs> Zap. It nails you. Everybody's looking at God like he's out to get you. When you've heard me say what? He's out to get you. Big difference. I was out to get Kara. She didn't have a chance. <laughs> I was out deer hunting, sitting on a rock. I didn't care about any deer going by. I was thinking about Kara. We had just broken up. Her fault, not mine. 
You don't believe that, do you? Uh, it's always my fault. But coming to the realization, this is the girl for me, then going after. I wasn't out to get her. I was out to get her. God's not out to get you, and here's your faults, and here's what you're doing wrong, and read scripture to find out. See how messed up you are? He already knows that. He knows you're a basket case. He knows you're a wrecked person. He knows you're a cripple. He knows I was a cripple. He's not out to whack you and show you, and I I don't want to go to the altar, and I feel so bad, and he already knows. He's out to bring you in. Leave the pride behind. Well, that's my shield. (laughs) That's my shield. Leave the vanity. Leave the lust behind. That's not me, but that's me. That's right. That's right. That's you, and it's being left behind. I have a new creation for you. I have a new person for you. But don't you know what I've done? I know what you've done. I saved Moses. I saved David. I saved Apostle Paul, who even persecuted the church, to set an example, a pattern, that even somebody who persecuted the church, I saved and made one who wrote the, the most of the New Testament and reached out to the Gentile world, of which you and I are a part today. To reproof, standard set, of which all things are then shown in, uh, in, in direct correlation with. Faults show up. That's why people don't like reading their Bibles. Faults show up. Next thing that shows up is what? For correction, there it is again. Correction. For correction. God brings correction into our life. I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit bring correction into my life. Are you able to say the same? Raise your hand before the Lord. I'm thankful for the correction that he has brought into my life. Once a child learns the first grade, move to the second grade. Learn those lessons, third grade. Of course, today our school system just moves you along. You don't have to learn anything. But you don't do that with the Lord. You can be 75 years old and still be in preschool. And then all of a sudden you can come to the Lord, and in one year you find yourself graduating high school, going into college. He accelerates. He accelerates. But this is where he'll show correction. He'll bring correction into our life. Not this way, this way. I remember working with my dad, and the first time I worked with him, and I'm showing me how to change a tire, started small, how to flip the old hubcaps off. That's before when they used to have hubcaps. And you take that little tool, and you drive it in, and you pop that hubcap, and I got it in there, and I pop it, and it pops off, pow, falls on the floor, and I just take it and put it on my side. Start taking the lug nuts off and throwing them also on the floor, and I'm doing the work. My father comes over, and he goes, why is that hubcap? Nice side down on the concrete. I just took it off, Dad. I'm changing the tire. That's somebody's hubcap, and that's a good way to scratch it. Turn it the other way. Lesson learned. Lesson learned. Never did that again. Because I know if I didn't learn my lesson there, instruction would become correction in a way I didn't want. correction. I could also have turned, you didn't show me the right way the first time. Why didn't you show me the right way the first time? I wouldn't have done it that way. We can act that way, you know. Yeah, that's the child in us. Instead of, I learned something. I remember getting into a car one time, and I moved the seat back and made it comfortable for myself so I could drive the car where I needed to go. He saw me do that. He says, never do that again. I need to test the car. He goes, you adjust to the seat, not the seat to you. He goes, somebody put that where they need it. They shouldn't have to come in, pick up their car, and then change it because you changed it. He learned hers lesson by one time changing the car seat for a person who had a backache. And they had the seat just right for themselves. He learned his lesson. He taught me. This doesn't mean my dad did all things well. Certainly not. But there were lessons to be learned in the small things as you grow and mature. God does that in our life. He brings correction. How? Through scripture. Why? So that we'll become complete in him. We must be people of the word. We must be people of scripture. 
Between these pages is your new life. Hear me now. Between the pages of this book is your new life. You will not find your life in any other book that is out there ever printed. You will find your new life inside the pages of this book. That's why we must know it and apply ourselves diligently to knowing Scripture. Lastly, for instruction in righteousness. Learning what it is to be righteous before Him. Knowing what it is to be in right standing for God. Being and doing. Being right before Him and doing right before Him. Having a right standing, walking upright, thoroughly equipped. Not the crippled life that cannot stand before Him, but instead the corrected life that can stand before Him. Scripture is teaching me, instructing me, training me. We dealt with that doctrine, that's teaching, the taught aspect. We dealt with the whole idea of reproof, that's the tested part. We dealt with correction, that's the true, being true. Having truth and true, being true. Having a tire, true, going down the road. Having a house that's built, true. It is plumb, it is level, everything is set right, it's true. Scripture is used to make us true, to make us right, that we're standing upright before Him. I'm standing upright before you, Lord. See? See? No, you're not. Stand upright. Okay, thank you, Lord. Yes. No, stand upright. Oh, thank you, Lord. Yes. I'm all set. No. And stand, no, here I am over here. And stand upright. What? I'm true before him. Upright. Instruction in righteousness is the training aspect. Being brought up slowly in the things of God, precept upon precept. You've been taught. You've been tested. You've been found true. And you're now being brought into a state of being trained rightly. So what? So you'll be thoroughly equipped, complete in him, thoroughly equipped for every good work. What is God doing in your life? What is God doing in my life? Taking and learning these scriptures and having it applied to our lives. This is the intent of this church. This is the intent of this pastor. This is the intent of God who said, go into all the world and what? Teach them. To do what? Obey all that I've commanded, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, meaning what? To immerse them into the name of Christ, to have their life saturated that they walk in the Spirit, and if you walk in the Spirit, what's it say? You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. God Almighty is bringing us to a point where we would live the corrected life. You and I will mess up, I guarantee it, because we're still inside this skin, that is saturated and every fiber of it is permeated with sin. Sin goes to every member and every aspect like capillaries go into the very fingertips of who you are. Sin goes there. But when this body is dropped off and your new life is one with him, he's preparing a new body for you, a glorified body, free from sin. God Almighty came to us in Jesus Christ, made in the body of a flesh, made in the likeness of man, made in the likeness of sinful man. And he became sin, though he had no sin. But the next time he comes, he says he's coming apart from sin and apart from flesh. And he's coming in the fullness of his glory. And that bright light will drive away all darkness. In this, he wants us to be thoroughly equipped in the light of his coming to stand erect and upright before him. Not in a crippled state, but in a corrected state. True, trained, thoroughly equipped, made complete in him so that we can look into the brightness of his coming and we welcome him rather than being driven away by him because we're just like him. He's birthed in us. Amen. This message needs to go deep into every soul. The crippled life or the corrected life. If you are in the upright state and the God is bringing you into development and he's training you and he's teaching you, then you can't go back to the crippled life. You can go and act like it and you can trade in all that God has for you, but you're going to look awfully foolish. God's word will come into your life, teach you, train you, correct you, test you, help us to become true in him so that we're right, true in the Lord. This is what I want for my own life, for my wife, for my family, for our grandchildren, for this church, for this community. 
wouldn't it be wonderful to see the communities come into right relationship with God and stand true, to be true rather than walking in the crippled life, to be true, to see, to see baby Reed, over just one, one years old, one years old, now walking upright. Teetering and tottering, but developing. To see him by his family, mom and dad, now teaching him precept upon precept. One thing after another, you need to learn this. Come help me, Reed. Come rake leaves with dad. Not this way. Wash the car. That's right, just, just like daddy. Wash it. That's it. No, that this way. Wax on, wax off. <laughs> this way. Rake leaves. This way. That's right. Bring the garbage out. That's right. This way. Good job, son. No, no, son. Not that way. This way. That's all he's doing. That's all he's doing in our lives. And yet so many are fighting against it. But that's all he's doing. Walking. Teaching him to walk. Holding his hand. Come on, son. Now behind him. Go off. I can't see you, dad. Look where you're going. Look where you're going. Come on, son. And all of a sudden, 16 and 17 and 18, and all of a sudden graduated from high school, and he's got that cardboard on his head, and he's going to be walking down. And there's Joel going to be. Go on, son. Go on, son. Same thing. Graduating from college or going into the service or doing both. Or, Come on, son. You can do it. Move ahead. That's it. Stay focused. Watch. Apply this to your life. No, no, son. Stay away from them. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, turn away from them. Chapter 3 says, turn away from them. Turn to this. Be of like mind. Stay in the faith. Stay true. That's what God is right behind you and right next to you. He not only launches you, but he sent his spirit to go alongside you. The paraclete, the helper. Right alongside, just in case you start faltering, He's got you by the hand, and he'll never let you go. I remember walking with, with our kids, and all of a sudden they'd lose their step or they'd trip, you know, right? And all of a sudden they'd be twirling on the end of my hand. I just picked them up, and they're like this. And all of a sudden you plant them, and they touch the ground, and boom, and they just start going again. He's got you. Walk with God. Let him train you, teach you hold you, embrace you, and let him launch you. He'll be right with you. He'll send his spirit. Is there an amen in the house? I know time is coming past 12, but I really would like to sing a song before the Lord. And if anybody wants prayer, come to the altar and say, yes, Lord. Kara, would you come and sing? And if you're saying, Lord, I want the corrected life. You've got it. But you're looking maybe for more growth. You're looking to give your life to the Lord. You're looking to just come forward and say, I want prayer for that. You're looking and just saying, I want to make a newfound commitment. I want to step forward towards the Lord. You may be just in your chair and just say, you know what? I'm going to kneel before the Lord. I'm just going to sing and open my heart to him. That's fine too. There's no prescribed way that this is what you must do. But God is going to give you a prescription right now and say, this is what I want you to do. What is it that the Lord would have you to do right now? Don't fight it. Yield to him. Maybe it's, Lord, give me a new love for your word. I pray for that regularly. I pray regularly. Almost a day doesn't go by where I don't pray, Lord, give me a love for your word, a love for your kingdom, and a love for my wife, a love for my family, a love for your people, a love for your spirit. Why? Because I know there's so much out there working against it. So, Lord, would you put that in my heart? Maybe that needs to be your prayer. But wherever you're at, let the prescription of the Lord come into your life and then do that. If it's coming forward, come forward. If it's asking for prayer, get prayer. If it is kneeling before the Lord, kneel. If it's just singing his praises, saying, Lord, I want you, then let's do that. But let it rain in your life. Amen? Amen. Kara.